and thank the Lord for a sweet spirit that we felt here in our midst and uh, and I only hope and pray that we are more uh, sensitive to the move of the Holy Spirit that we won't uh, we won't uh, uh, go contrary to the move of the Spirit. We always need to flow with the Spirit. We always need to be sensitive to what the Lord wants us to understand, what the Lord wants us to do in our service, in the worship service. If there's a need, if there's a pressing need in your life that you really have, uh, don't wait where you are, but just jump in the water. Just come forward and, 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 and just surrender yourself to the Lord. And let the Lord touch your heart. Let the Lord touch your mind. Let the Lord free you from some demonic spirits and some from strongholds that binds you, and from the rebellious attitude and uh, the rebellious nature that that is binding you from giving yourself to the Lord. Let the Lord free you. Uh, let the Lord take a hold of your life. Uh, let the Lord lead you and guide you. And because sometimes what can happen is in this Christian walk. As we fight battles, as we fight uh, the enemy, uh, we get tired. Uh, we think, oh, it's not use. Uh, it's of no use uh, living as a Christian. It's of no use uh, giving so much to the Lord. We think that the Lord is not on our side. <coughs> uh, we always want the Lord to be on our side. But we never think, are we on the Lord's side? The Lord will never be on the side of a person who's a, who's, who's a rebel, who's wrong, uh, who, has a, who, has a, who has a God awful spirit. Uh, the Lord can, will never be on the side of that person. Uh, it's time for that person to come on the side of the Lord. That is what the Lord is looking for. And we need to be, that's why I was saying, we need to be sensitive even <clears throat> for the workings of God in our life. What is the Lord trying to trying to tell us? What is the Lord trying to show me? What is the Lord trying to trying to make me understand in this given situation? Yes, there will be battles. As long as we are alive, saints, we have to fight battles. Whether there are spiritual battles, whether there are battles uh, with our health, whether there are battles in the family or relationships or uh, regarding anything, we have to, uh, we have to fight battles. That's the uh, that's why a Christian is called a Christian. Uh, is called a soldier. <clears throat> we are soldiers. A soldier is called to fight. Uh, but we need to understand that our weapons are not carnal. We, we don't fight with carnal weapons. And our enemy is not someone in flesh and blood. Not Mr. So-and-so, Miss So-and-so, Mrs. So-and-so is not an enemy. We fight a common enemy and that is the devil. We don't war against flesh and blood but we war against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. That's our enemy. He is our enemy. And we need to understand that yes, there will be times when the enemy uh, enemy looks very strong. Oh, he, he it will be, be a big giant standing before you. And uh, that giant will be standing there for a long time. For a long time. It may, have, it may be years, months, or it may be uh, it may be a few weeks, but the enemy is there, standing right before you, and you don't know what to do. You've been trying your best because because sometimes we feel that uh, that uh, we are well equipped to fight on our own. Uh, we can handle this on our own. We can uh, we can take take matters in our own hands and do things in our own. But I want to take you uh, through a, through a chapter in the Bible and here in the first Samuel. Tell you a story that everyone sitting here is familiar. And sometimes very hard to preach on a story that everyone knows. I'm talking about David and Goliath. Now you may say, oh, what is what did Brother Joy speak about David and Goliath? We we know this story from our childhood. And yes, as I said, it's very hard to preach sometimes on things that on on, 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 on passages of scriptures or stories in the Old Testament that we all have thought of growing up. But I hope and pray that the Lord will open our eyes of understanding today a little bit more. And uh, and there was a, the scripture says in 1st Samuel chapter 17 and if you read verse 4 it says there went out a champion 
out of the camp of the Philistines. This, this called Goliath is called a champion. Uh, we need to understand the enemy that we are fighting, the devil, he's a champion. Don't underestimate him. Don't treat him like an ordinary, ordinary uh, enemy. Uh, he's a champion in what he does. He's a champion in wickedness. He's a champion in in, uh, in, in, in in rebellion. He's a champion in disobedience. He's a champion in sowing discord among brothers. He's a champion in breaking marriages. He's a champion in, 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 in breaking down uh, relationships. He's a champion. And there was a champion. The scripture says even in verse 23 of the same chapter. And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion of the Philistines. Uh, the, the scripture calls Goliath as a champion. He's called a champion. And uh, this is an old story. This is a famous story. And I hope that the Lord will give us some insight to this story and that can change our lives here today. And we, just to give you a little background, I'm not going to read the whole chapter, but I may read a few verses here and there. But just to give you a background, Saul <coughs> is the king of Israel right now. He was the first king. Uh, and Saul at this moment, is in a bachelor condition. It's a problem when the when the head, when when the king himself is in a bachelor condition. There can not, not be anything worse than that. And here Saul has lost his anointing. Uh, he had the gift, but he had lost his anointing. Uh, we need to understand when the Lord blesses us with gifts, He doesn't take those gifts back from us. The gifts stay, but the Lord removes His anointing from us. The anointing was no longer on Saul, and uh, he he had lost the voice of God. Uh, he was getting deeper in despair. He was getting in depression because of the, of sin and disobedience in his life. Uh, enemies had slipped inside the valley. He was sitting there in the tent, hiding from the enemy. He was sitting in fear because there was a champion standing out there that even Saul was afraid of. Even Saul, the king, was afraid of. And he was sitting with fear. The scripture says, uh, here in <coughs> verse 11, <coughs> when Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. The anointed of the Lord was afraid because the champion was great. And, and Saul thought that he cannot fight against that, that man. And the enemy had slipped inside the valley, it says in verse 3. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on one side, Israel stood on the mountain on the other side, and there was a valley in between. So you had to pass through that valley to fight the Philistine. And Goliath used to come in that valley every day for 40 days. He used to come and tell, is there a champion inside? in your tent who can fight me one on one. One on one. Send your champion to me. Send your man who you think is a champion and let us fight one on one. And he used to come inside this valley and we need to understand that this Goliath was a descendant of Enoch. And, the, and, 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 and Enoch lived in the land of Canaan when uh, when the Israelites were about to enter into the land of Canaan, we remember that scripture. Um, two years down in the wilderness, they came at the door of the promised land and Moses sent 12 spies. And what, did the, what report did the spies bring? That there are giants in the land, right? Didn't they say there are giants in the land? They were these, these, these were the giants. They were the descendants of Enoch. And Goliath was his descendant. And 38 years later, 40 years later, the Israelites barged into Jericho under the leadership of Joshua, took up Jericho, took up the promised land and drove those giants out. And when those giants ran, they ran into four or five cities. And Goliath was from Gath. And Gath was one of the cities where all those giants ran. And it says in verse, and there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath. Gath was that place where all those giants fled when the, when, when the Israelites pursued after them. And this enemy of the past now comes back. How many times our past 
comes back haunting us. This enemy of the past is back now. And Goliath know, knows, he knew the history. He knew that his descendants, his ancestors, sorry, his ancestors were driven away from Canaan. And Israelites were the cause for that. And fear and doubt had paralyzed the Israelites again. This giant was, was too big. He was demeaning the army of Israel. How many times the scripture says, uh, let's read our scripture here in verse 10. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. He, used, he defied the very army of God. He defied the name of God. He blasphemed the name of God. He was standing there blaspheming the God of Israel. And no one stood before that giant. No one had the, had the faith or had the courage to stand before that giant. No one. And he, is to, he, he, he challenged them. He challenged them in verse 8. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are you come to set your battle in array? Am I not a Philistine and you the servants to Saul? Choose you a man from you and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall you be our servants and serve us. And he did that, the scripture says, every day for 40 days. Where is the scripture? Uh, uh, I think it's in, uh, it, it says, right, he, 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 he did that for 40 days. Verse? Yes, verse 16. And the Philistine drew near morning and evening and presented himself 40 days. He did two things. He blasphemed the name of God and he issued a challenge to the army of Israel. The very armies of the God. That, that had saved Israel. God had brought Israel out of, from a mighty hand. The Israelites knew their history. The Israelites knew about their God. They knew, but I think they didn't believe in the power of God. And we need to understand this is not army against army. This is one on one combat. This is one man against one man. It's not an army fighting an army. Once again, Israel is under the attack of the ancient spirit that once hunted them and now he's come back to challenge them and they are failing the test and they are giving in into the enemy they are failing the test and and Saul should have been out there he was a king he would have he should have led by example he should have been there on the battlefield he the scripture says about Saul when 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 Samuel anointed Saul the scripture says if I'm not mistaken that he was head and shoulders above everyone in Israel. He was tall. He had a personality that you could make make out Saul from 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 the group of people sitting there. Saul had a had a personality that you could not overlook. He was head and shoulders about everyone. But but now he is failed here. He is failed. He is he he. He, 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 he didn't have the faith that he once had because of his rebellion, because of his disobedience. If you don't understand, if we don't keep God's word, if we are not faithful to the Lord, we lose the power that we receive from God. You may be anointed. You may be used of God once upon a time. But if you rebel, if you don't humble yourself, if you work in pride, you lose your power that you had once upon a time. And Saul didn't have the, the, the same strength, didn't have the same power that he had once upon a time. But David, right now the story inserts, David here is sent from, by his father. It says, it says the father uh, was 17, Jesse said unto David is a son. Uh, take now for thy brethren and he passed. She said, take the, take, take the corn and cheese sandwiches for your brothers. Take the sandwiches. Take some corn, some bread, some cheese. Go there. Uh, he was busy keeping his sheep. And he was sent on the 40th day. He was sent there. And in, it says in verse 
uh, verse 18 and 19 and, uh, and it says must verse 19 and now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines and David rose up early in the morning left the sheep with the keeper and took and went as Jesse had commanded him and came to the trench as the host was going forth to fight and shouted for the battle and David now hears the story he, he now hears what's happening <coughs> and when David heard that David, when he heard what Goliath was doing, David, when he heard what the champion was, and he was, he was a big man. It says he was six cubits and a span. He was, he was nine feet, six inches. If you want to know the height of Goliath, he was nine feet, six inches tall. And he was huge. He was huge. He, 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 had a, he had a physique that would, that would put any man, any man in fear. And David knew all these things. And David, when he heard this, what did David say? He says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Who is this champion that is defying the very name of God? And blaspheming the name of God. David knew. David knew. God, God's name should be hallowed. Uh, he, he knew that God wanted his name to be above every other name. Thou shalt not have any other God before me. You shall serve the Lord and thy Lord only you shall serve. He knew the commandments. He knew the power of God. And he said, who is this champion? Or whoever it is. He didn't even use the word champion. He says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Who is this man who is defying the very armies of God? It says in verse 20, uh, 25. And the men of Israel said, have you, have, you, have you seen this man that has come up? David, you are talking too much. Have you ever seen that man? How big he is. He is a champion. He is a champion. You know how tall he is, how strong he is. David said, I don't know. I don't want to know how strong my enemy is. David said, I know how strong my God is. They, that's why David's, David's called a man after God's own heart. You don't need strength here to fight your enemy. You need strength from there to fight your enemy. And David knew where his strength came from. And he said in verse 26, David spoke to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And David and David and the people that answered him and this man and said, So shall it be done to the man that killed him. And now immediately David's elder brother. <coughs> he had seven brothers, and this was the eldest of the, uh, the three brothers of David were serving in, the, in Saul's army. There were already three brothers, the first, the elder, and the second, and the third. The first three brothers were serving in Saul's army, and even they were afraid. And this elder brother tells David, now in verse 28, he, his anger was kindled against David and said, Why came thou? Why did you come here? Who do you think you are, David? By the way, who do you think you are? You're just a tiny little young man. You are only worthy of keeping sheep. Go back. You don't belong here. This is the this, this, this is for men. You are just a boy. This belongs. This is a battlefield. This is for men. You are not. You are not welcome here, kid. Just go back. And he says. He says, Why came you here? And who's taking care of the sheep in the wilderness? And I know your your pride. See, 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 see that man, see that brother talking to David. I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart. For you have just come here so that you can see the fight. They said, David, you're not qualified. Go back to the sheep. And the first giant that David had to conquer was not the giant named Goliath. The first giant that David had to conquer was the giant of criticism from his elder brothers. Since when you take a stand for God, you will be, you'll be criticized. 
Your family will go against your decision. Your family won't like what you're doing. Your, your, your wife may go back, go against you. Your husband may go back. Your parents may not like what you're doing. Before fighting the champion, we need, we need to first fight the fight, fight, fight criticism. You, if you can't take stand for the church right now, you mean to say in the times to come we'll take stand against the devil? If I can't make, make some time and walk in the house of God on a Sunday morning, before time, and come here and spend some time in worship, and spend some time in the house of God, you think I'll sustain in the days to come? This boy had a relationship with God which none of his brothers had. This boy knew God better than anyone in Israel at that point of time. And I think God should bless me, God should do this for me, God should do that for me. He should answer my prayer, He should bless my business, He should bless me on my job, He should do this, do this, do this, do this. But what am I doing? What's first in my life? Where does my strength come from? He was ready to accept criticism and not to make criticism his weakness. Don't let people's criticism weaken your vision or uh, weaken your revelation or diminish your vision. Stand for the Lord. Stand for the truth. Stand for the house of God. Stand for God's people. Stand for the name of the Lord. No one should be able to blaspheme God's name before me. And David says, Saul was, right now Saul was hiding in his tent. And I don't know, I'm, I want to cut the whole story short. And, and, and David goes <coughs> right there in Saul's tent. Verse 32. He said unto Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight this Philistine. David said, I'll go and fight. I'll fight. I can do it. Saul said, oh, you're just a young man in verse 33. You're not, you're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. You are just a youth. You are just growing now. This man has been a warrior for his youth. Since the champion that we are fighting has more experience than you and I. He's been around for 6,000 years. The devil's been around for 6,000 years. He's defeated greats, great people. Saul said, you are just a young man. But this man, Goliath, has been fighting since his younger days. He is a champion. And David said to Saul, thy servant kept his father's sheep. And one day, there came a lion. There came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. The lion, imagine the lion caught hold of one of the lambs and ran. The lamb was in the mouth of the lion. And David said, I went, I ran after the lion and smote that lion with my sling. I smote that lion with my sling and delivered. Just imagine David took the lamb out of the lion's mouth. And he said, I caught that lion by the beard and smote him and slew him. The other time, a bear came. And the bear was trying to take some of my sheep and slaughter some of the lambs. I fought the bear. And I slew the bear. He says in verse 36, I, thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine this man, whoever you all call him, whatever he is, shall be as one of them, seeing that he had defied the armies of David, had a passion to stand for God. David had a, had a passion to see to whether God's name should never be blasphemed through my life. Saints, do we have a passion here today that the way we live, our life should not blaspheme God's name? 
Nobody should be able to point a finger at God and say, this brother, this sister, they serve the Lord, I know how they are. I don't want to serve the God that they serve. But David, he said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? When Saul tried to discourage him, <coughs> David said, I have some experiences, Saul. I have some experiences in my life that God has taken me through. If God can give me those little victories, God can give me great victories. In God, if God can take me out of little troubles, He can take me out from great troubles. If God can take me through a little storm, He can take me out from a big storm. If God can take me through a little fire, He can keep me and take me out from a great fire. My God, which helped me to fight the lion and the bear, will help me to fight this champion, this Philistine. David said, I have an experience. King, I have an experience. David was being prepared in the desert. He was not wasting his time keeping that sheep. He was not wasting the time. God sent a lion one day. God sent a bear one day. God must have sent a fox one day. A jackal one day. Which David didn't, doesn't even mention. God must have sent a small uh, a snake many times. Uh, but, but, but he fought with every animal that was there in the wilderness. And David was being prepared right in the backside of the desert. For something that God had in store for him in the valley of Elah. He was being prepared. And Saul thought that victory comes by arms and wearing the armor and, 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 and taking the sword. God, he says in verse 37, David said, the Lord that delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of this hand of the Philistine. And Saul said, go and the Lord be with thee. And Saul armed David with his armor. He put a helmet and and armed him with a coat of mail. <coughs> and David girded his sword up. And he asked it to go, for he had not proved it. David said, How can I how can I take this armor? I've never I, 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 I've never used it, I've never proved it. <coughs> and David took all that off. Saul thought that strength was what he had in the arms and the ammunition and the armies that he had with him. Saul thought there was strength in what he had in the bank. Saul thought there was strength with what he had in, in property. Saul thought there was strength in what he had when he had people with him. One of the scriptures says here, uh, here that Saul, <coughs> well, uh, chapter 14, we'll come back to 17, but here in chapter 14, and the last verse, it says, And there was sore war against the Philistines all the days of Saul. And when Saul saw any strong man or any valiant man, he took him unto him. Whenever Saul saw a brave man, a strong man, a valiant man, he said, come join my army, join my army, join my army. And now, all of Saul's valiant, strong men were hiding in their tents. And no one could stand against this giant. And Saul thought that victory came, came from men, and came from arms, and came from, came from things that he had accumulated. But David said, I don't need all these things, Saul. I don't need these things. I have my rocks and I have my sling. It may not look much. It may not look much to you. But we need to understand, David was being prepared by God in the wilderness. David was not wasting his time. I'm telling you, saints, you're not wasting your time here in church today. <laughs> you're not wasting your time here in church today. God's preparing you. God's preparing you, God's preparing me, God's preparing us as a church. That's why it's very important to walk in the house of God. It's not a waste of time, it's a preparation. It's, it's here that we learn the song of the Lamb and the song of Moses. It's here that we learn the songs of deliverances. It's here that we learn how to revive the spirit of the, of, of the poor and the contrite ones. It's here that we learn how God helps the helpless. It's here that we learn that when everything fails, God comes and stands for us. 
We're not wasting our time coming to church. We are being prepared in the house of God. The time that is spent in worship is not a waste of time. It's drawing strength from heaven itself. When we lift up our hands and we raise up our voices and we say hallelujah. Thank you God for bringing me in your sanctuary. Thank you God is at that time that God touches my heart and shows me what's inside of my heart and brings out the dirt and the filth of my heart and I say God rain down upon me heaven's showers. And cleanse my heart, O oh God. Search, O oh God, if there be any wicked way in me. And Lord, show me my faults. Show me my sins. And help me, God, to have a revival of repentance. We need a revival of repentance in this church. There are hard rocks sitting here that have not repented for many years. They don't even take the church seriously. Don't even walk in the church on time. Just using the church and throwing it off. One day there will be a champion standing, out, standing in front of you and you won't be able to do anything my dear brothers and sisters. It's here that you are prepared. It's here your children will be safe. It's here your marriages will stay strong. Try going out and acquiring everything. What gain is it if a man gain the whole world and lose his soul? You think it's a waste of time coming to church, getting up early on a Sunday? Oh, one day I get to sleep. You'll sleep for a thousand years, my friend. And come up in the, in the resurrection of damnation and be destroyed and die the second death. Don't take the church nor the word of God lightly. And David, David had just a sling and a few stones that will not look much. Oh, what is this, David? There are the swords and the shields and the spears and the armor, David. What are you going with? A sling and a stone? It may not look much. You may think you don't have much. But I know that prayer works. I know that fasting works. I know I don't have much, but I have a part of prayer. I know I don't have much, but I have little what I give to the Lord. I know I don't have much of this world's riches, but whatever I have, I give it to the Lord. I know I don't have much, but I've seen God delivering my brothers, God delivering my fathers, God delivering my sisters from the lions and the bears. I know I don't have much, but I know how prayer changes my heart. I don't have much with me today. But Lord, whatever I have is yours. This sling and these rocks are yours, O God. Use it the way you want to use it. I don't have much, but I know the blood of Jesus works. When I apply the blood of Jesus on me and on my family members, it works. It was, brother. It was in your text. It keeps the angel of death away. I don't have much. I only have a, I only have a pot with, a, with one meal of flour and just a jar of oil. I don't have much, Elijah. I don't have much. But what I have is yours, man of God. Take it. Take it. Take it and that vessel of oil did not run dry as long as they were alive. What do you have? You may think, oh God, I don't have anything. Give what you have to the Lord. You have a weakness, give it to God. What's holding you back? 
from coming and kneeling down here. You're ashamed of losing your face? I'd rather lose my face in the house of God, rather lose my face in the day of judgment. I've watched God take the toughest situations and the worst situations and turn them around on his head. I've watched God do that in my life. I've watched God suffice what I have in my life. I've seen God give me before my jar was empty. I've seen God do that. I've seen God being Yehovah Yahweh. I've seen that. I don't need any proof from anyone. I have God as a proof himself. I watch God raise me from the dunghill and set my feet on the rock to stay. I watch God cleanse me from the inside. I watch God take situations that were impossible for me to handle. And I've seen God handle those situations on his own. I've seen God protect me, provide for me, and do so many things. I hope and I pray this is a testimony of everyone sitting here. If no, test God and see. Don't take him lightly. And the brilliance of God is seen in this story. Just imagine, nobody could defeat Goliath in a hand-to-hand -hand combat. There was no, no way, even if David reached to Goliath and fought with his hand, there was no way even David could win. But the brilliance of God is that he'll take an unlikely person and, and he'll take a person that doesn't look like they've got much. But God says, yes, this person has been with me. This person has, stayed, has been faithful to me. This person has stood with me. This person was, was in my church when no one was. This person was faithful in his prayers. This person was faithful. God will choose a person that you think is not fit for this situation. And God will raise up a man. God will raise up a woman. God will raise up a person that we think is not suitable for that situation. And God, but God says, this is my vessel. This is the one that I'll bring from the backside of the desert, which none standing in Saul's army could do what David did. He didn't have many weapons. God says, this man that I'm using right now didn't go with a sword and a spear in the wilderness. He didn't, because David didn't trust in the weapons, David trusted in God. And God said, this man David, who trusted me for everything, I will use such a man to fight the greatest battle in history. Saying this battle is the greatest battle in history. Just imagine the books written on this. On this, the movies made on this. Just imagine the, the phrase today, David and Goliath is even used by the world. This story is a story that even the unchristians know about. But for that story to take place, God was looking for a man that had nothing but faith. Nothing but faith. And just imagine David walking now. Saul says, go. And just imagine, the Philistines are on this mountain, the armies, and the armies of Israel on that mountain. And there's a valley in between. And Goliath stands. Goliath stands there in the valley and he's shouting and defying God and he's showing a, 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 a threat to the armies. And David, just imagine David now walking down into the valley. And I imagine David walking down in the valley and quoting Psalms 23 and singing his own song and saying, The Lord 
is my shepherd. I shall not want. He leadeth me beside still waters. He leadeth me <coughs> in great pastures. He's quoting, he's singing that song to his God. And then when he's climbing down the valley, he's saying, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall not fear Goliath. I can see Goliath's shadow <coughs> coming on me. I can see Goliath's shadow coming down and touching me. But he says, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil because God, you are with me. Your Lord and your staff, they comfort me. And David said, I'm not fighting this battle on Goliath's stones. I'm fighting this battle on God's stones. And the scripture says, Goliath ran towards David. And even David was running towards Goliath. But even before David could reach Goliath, he took a stone from his back, put it in a sling, and hit it. And his ring went between the eyes of Goliath. And one stone, David had five. But God says, one is enough. One is enough, David. One is enough. And who directed that stone? It was not David's, David's skill. It was the power and the hand of God that took the stone from the sling and hit it in Goliath's forehead. Well, who is the champion standing before you today? I'm not through with this lesson. Wait. It's going to become interesting. It will become interesting. David just used that little thing that he had. He didn't have a spear or a sword, an armor on his thigh, and a coat of scales and all those things. He just had his little sling and some sticks and some stones. Use what God has given you, saints. Use your, use your prayer. Use the Bible that God has given you. It may look little in the eyes of this world, but they are powerful. Prayer is a powerful weapon. The word of God is a sword, it says. David didn't need a physical sword. He had the word of God in his heart. And that sword was enough to slay the lion. He didn't have a shield, physical shield, but he had the shield of faith. He had the shield of faith. He didn't have a physical armor, but he had the breastplate of righteousness. He didn't have a physical helmet, but he had the helmet of salvation. David was armed with an armor that cannot be seen with the eyes. But he was armed with an armor that no power of hell can penetrate that armor. In the name of Jesus. He was armed with the armor of God, not with the armor of Saul. Don't be armed with what you have. Arm, get armed, arm yourself, arm yourself with the armor of God. It may look weak, whatever things you have, your prayer, uh, your Bible, you're quoting the promises of God. It may look weak, but keep using those armors every day. Keep using those little, little stuff every day. Pray every day. Pray every day. Quote the scriptures every day. Read the Bible every day. Come to church every service. Keep doing those little, little things. And one day, when God wants someone, He'll use you. Our weapons, the scripture says, are not carnal, but spiritual. To the pulling down of the strongholds, Paul said. There was a stronghold standing right before David, but one little slingshot brought down the stronghold named Goliath. <coughs> he didn't get on Goliath's level. He fought Goliath on God's terms. Don't get, don't get even with your enemy. Back off. Let God do some work also. Amen. Let God do some work also. You don't fight as though you are the champion. Now I'm coming to the point. I am not the champion. But I have a champion. I'm not a champion. 
Neither can I be one. But I have a great champion. This battle was not between a great giant and a little boy. This battle was between a great God and a tiny giant. Only David had the proper perspective of, of who his enemy was and who his God was. And that's why he won the victory. The scripture says so many times that David was upset. He was upset because he was defying the name of the Lord. He was defying the armies of Israel. He was blaspheming the name of the Lord. And you know, saints, in the Old Testament, what was the, what was the uh, punishment for blasphemy? What was it? If you blaspheme the name of God under the old covenant, you are supposed to be stoned to death. What happened to Goliath? He was stoned to death. David, when he was walking with his stone and his sling, he had the assurance of God's word with him. This is a man that's blaspheming the name of my God. I'm going to stone him to death, Saul. And David, when he hit that stone, he knew it was not his skill. It was God that had died that stone and slay Goliath with just one stone. Just one stone. And it smoked Goliath. And he's, it was God that was backing, backing David at that time. And many times when we read such stories, we think that we are David. Right? We put ourselves in David's shoes and we think that person, our brother so and so, our sister so and so is Goliath. According to your faith, let it be done to you. No brother so and so or sister so and so is Goliath. Goliath in the Bible refers to the devil himself. If you keep fighting with brother so and so and sister so and so to save your face, you will never be able to fight Goliath. Don't fight with brother so and so and sister so and so. Don't fight with Mr. so and so and, sis and Mrs. so and so. Don't fight with your mother-in-law, daughter-in-law, sister-in-law, brother-in-law, whichever in-laws. You are weak when you fight with people. And the more you fight with people, the more weak spiritually you become. And we think we are David. We always will win, will win, will win, God. I am David in the story, God. I am, I, I am the three Hebrew children in the story, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I am not the other Jewish boys who sat in their house and uh, which bowed before Nebuchadnezzar's image. I am not those boys. I am Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I am not. I am, the, I am not the greedy lot. I am the faithful Abraham God. Right? We all say that. We all say that. I, 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 will, I will never be the disciple that denied Jesus, Lord. I am the faithful disciple. I am not a greedy Cain. I am a giving Abel. The reality is we are not the hero of the story. We are not the hero of the story. We are nothing but rebels. And we are nothing but cowards. We are nothing but Pharisees. We are nothing but bad, 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 bad stories. We are nothing but losers. We are nothing but sinners. We are nothing but failures. We are not the hero in our story. <coughs> and if I don't accept that, I don't understand the Bible yet. Because this Bible has only one hero and that's Jesus Christ. This Bible has no human heroes because we have more failures of people mentioned in the Bible than their victories. So if you fail, don't think it's over. Repent, turn around, change your mind and come back to the Lord. 
He is the hero. He is the champion of champions. He is the living God. He is the father of mercies. There is room for everyone. At the foot of the cross. I don't. I, I, I am not a champion. But I have. A champion. I'm just sitting on a mountain of fear like the Israelites were sitting on a mountain. I'm sitting on a mountain of fear. I'm sitting on a mountain of failure. I'm sitting on a mountain of depression. I'm sitting on a mountain of timidity. I'm sitting on a mountain of, of, of weakness and tiredness trying to fight the battle on my own. I'm tired of God. I'm sick of God. I'm just tired of running and chasing pretty rainbows. Go and try to catch hold of the rainbow. The more you go towards that rainbow, the more far the rainbow goes from you. You can never touch the rainbow. If you have some dreams in your life, give them all to Jesus. He will take what's wrong in your life and make it right. We are not. We are just depressed. We are a group of people. We are a group of failures sitting here today, redeemed by the blood of Jesus. Let's accept it. Amen. 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 We are nothing but fearful rabbits sitting in this church, and a devouring lion is moving out. Don't make yourself the hero. Don't call yourself the champion. We have a champion sitting on the right hand of God today, which ever makes intercession for us. We may say, oh, what about Romans 8? Joy, which says, nay, we are more than conquerors, right? Right? What does it say in Romans 8? 30, I don't know where it's actually. 34, 35, somewhere. Nay, but in all this, we are more than conquerors. Quote the whole scripture, my friend. If I'm not mistaken, it says, through him. Through him. Verse 47. Verse 37, sorry. Romans 8 and verse 37. Let's all read the scripture clear and loud. taking so much time. Let's all read it together. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. Stop. That's what people quote. Because they think they are the heroes. When you quote the scripture, this is where you stop. Because this is where the flesh wants to stop. But the one in the spirit will quote the full scripture. Now let's read the full scripture from the beginning. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Through our champion, we become more than conquerors. It's through Jesus Christ. You don't need to awaken the champion in you. You need to be awakened yourself and realize that you have a champion sitting on the right hand of God. The world teaches you, awaken the champion in you. Awaken the champion in you. There's no champion in me. My champion is sitting on the right hand of God. And he doesn't need to be awake. He's always working. He's always awake. I just need to be aware of my champion. His name is Jesus. Who's your hero? Jesus is my hero. I am not. I am a sinner saved by grace. But with the blood of my hero, whose name is Jesus. The battle is not won by soldiers on both sides. You see, no, none of the soldiers on both the sides fought. It was won by the champion. And that champion was Jesus. Jesus is called the root and the offspring of David in Revelation. How can one person be the root and the offspring? The root means Jesus said before David was, I was already there. And the offspring means when I wanted to take birth, 
I choose the lineage of David. That's why he's also called the son of David, but he's also the father. He's also the elder brother. He's also the savior of David. He is the root and the offspring of David. The word champion. The word champion in this passage means the one who stands in between. That is the word meaning of the Hebrew word champion. In between. The man who stands in between. Goliath was the man who stood in between the people of God and the faith. And the giant had to be brought down. But my champion Jesus stands in between me and death. My champion is Jesus, the man who stands in between me and death. And he offers me life. That's my champion. The word champion means the one who stands in between. Who stands in between me and death today? Jesus. He is my champion. He is the one who stands in between. Thank God for our champion. Thank God for our king. Thank God for Jesus who is the captain of our salvation. Thank God for everything that he's given us. Is given us all things, the scripture says in First Peter, pertaining unto life and godliness. Whatever you things you need to need, live your life is given you. Whatever things you need to live a godly life is given you. You don't need anything else. Your champion is provided everything that you need. You may think it's not sufficient, but I'm here to tell you, whatever you have, use it for the Lord. Use it for the Lord. It may look tiny, it may look little, it may look weak, but God says when you are weak, Let's realize our weakness, saints. Let's come boldly to the throne of grace here today. Let's come boldly to the throne of grace. I can, I can feel the Spirit of the Lord moving in this place right now. I can feel the power of the Holy Ghost. And if there's something that's keeping you from touching God and for asking God what you need, I urge you, brethren, why you don't stand up and touch the Lord and ask the Lord what you need. Ask the Lord, Lord, take what I have. Oh Lord, it may look little, it may look feeble, it may look a lot of small thing, oh God. But we know that oh Lord has any small thing in your hand, oh Lord. <laughs> Lord, take care of your people here today. Oh God, we are not the hero, God. We are not the hero, God. 